Greetings everyone. My name is Sayantan and I'm a PhD student at McGill University. Today I will be presenting Neural Shadow Mapping, a work done in collaboration with my PhD supervisor Derek Noros Zarai and Christoph Sheed and Zhao Dong from Materiality Labs. Shadows provide important geometric depth and shading cues. Despite decades of advancements, real-time rendering of hard and soft shadows remains a challenge especially on a resource-limited system. Shadow mapping and its variants such as moment shadow maps are fast but prone to issues such as light leaking, shadow aliasing, and limited contact hardening. On the other hand, ray tracing coupled with post-process denoising and upscaling can deliver high-quality dynamic shadows but are mostly limited to high-end hardware. Finally, traditional pre-computation-based techniques are predominantly suitable for static environments and near-field light transport. Our approach uses shadow mapping and neural networks to generate high-quality hard and soft shadows. The technique relies on data instead of hand-tuned heuristics to minimize artifacts such as light leaking, aliasing, and contact hardening. Additionally, we support dynamic scenes, untrained geometry, and a user-controlled spectrum of hard to soft shadows. We generate a set of screen space buffers using a G-buffer and a shadow mapping pass and use them as inputs to our convolutional neural network. The network acts as a screen space filter and allows for easy integration into the rendering pipeline. The output of the network is compared against ray-traced shadows as the target during training. During inference, our network controls the softness of the shadows with the user input, the emitter size. The network is trained at 5 discrete emitter size interval from 0 to 4. We modulate an input buffer using the emitter size and compare the network output with the corresponding ray trace target. Thus, our training methodology allows the network to generate hard and soft shadows only using rasterization. Selecting a subset of buffers from the rasterization output that are crucial for learning a mapping between the input and the output is a challenge. Choosing a minimal subset of inputs not only avoids overfitting, but also reduces memory bandwidth and improves network runtime performance. A naive approach for selecting important features is to use a feature selection network cascaded before the main network and training the two networks end to end. The feature selection network compresses the rasterization output to a few channels but also adds an additional runtime overhead. Our approach on the other hand eliminates the need for a feature extraction network by systematic evaluation and selection of the rasterization output buffers. We first introduce the notion of sensitivity, a metric we use to quantify the importance of a feature. Sensitivity measures a change in the network output due to a small perturbation in the input. We measure sensitivity by comparing two network outputs one with a small perturbation applied to an input channel, and the second without the perturbation applied. More formally, we compute the sensitivity for the ith channel using the equations shown on the right. The perturbations are derived from an empirically estimated standard deviation for each channel. With our metric defined, we only select buffers with a sensitivity higher than 1.5%. Now that we have discussed our network training inputs and their selection process, we look at the composition of our loss function. Our base loss function is a weighted sum of per pixel loss and VGG19 loss. While VGG loss improves anti-aliasing, we complement it with a lower weight per pixel loss to reduce training instabilities. We see that VGG19 indeed produces sharper edges for shadow and geometry silhouettes as shown in the next clip. Next we introduce our perturbation loss. The loss aims at improving temporal stability but does so without using any temporal buffers or TAA at runtime. Temporal instabilities arise due to shadow map aliasing, where shadow map texels do not align one to one with screen pixels. As such, a small movement in emitter or camera can cause a large change in depth comparisons, especially around shadow silhouettes. Training with perturbation loss forces the network to produce stable shadows under such conditions. Inspired from noise to noise, our perturbation loss considers the network input as noisy and constrains the network to produce the same output under different perturbations of the input. Computing the perturbation loss involves evaluating several instances of the network under different input perturbations. The output of the instances are compared 
and the loss is back propagated through one of the network instances. We found the perturbation loss to cause a small decrease in image quality but significantly improve temporal stability. The decrease in image quality is attributed to additional spatial blurring caused by the perturbed training. Next, we look at our approach for measuring temporal stability. Several techniques exist that measures the overall combined reconstruction quality across screen space and time. However, in our case, we sacrifice spatial quality for temporal stability. As such, these metrics may not indicate a reduction in error metric due to perturbation loss, even when there is a clear visual reduction in temporal flickering. We introduce a new metric that aims to measure only the temporal fluctuations. To measure the temporal fluctuations, we find the motion vector adjusted per pixel temporal difference. Since flickering can be quantified as an abrupt change in the pixel intensities between frames, we penalize the large differences more by passing the temporal pixel difference through an exponential. Finally, we aggregate the results across pixels and frames. We now show the results of perturbation loss using our metric. Our loss compares favorably with TAA in scenes with camera motion and performs better in scenes with emitter animation. While TAA uses historical buffers and require additional runtime, our technique avoids such penalties. Next, we discuss the network architecture and several optimizations required to make the network real-time. We start with the original unit architecture. However, the vanilla architecture is too slow for real-time use. As such, we make several modifications and trim the network down to fit our runtime budget. We first reduce the convolution kernel size from 3x3 3 3 to 1x1 1 1 for one of the convolutions. On the decoder side, we replace the upscaling transpose convolution with simple bilinear upscaling. To save even more bandwidth, we simply sum the skip connection with previous layer output instead of concatenating. To further improve temporal stability, we remove the first skip connection, preventing the noisy input from directly affecting the output. We also replace the max pooling with average pooling, thereby minimizing extremities in the signal and reducing noise. At this stage, our network runtime is 28 milliseconds. Switching to half precision further reduces the runtime to 17 milliseconds. While 17 milliseconds is a good improvement, we still do not compare well with respect to more traditional techniques such as moment shadow maps in terms of performance. We note that the first layer consumes disproportionately more time due to convolutions and high resolution inputs. As such, we completely remove any convolution from the first layer and replace the layer with passive elements while keeping the rest of the layers unchanged. On the encoder side, the pixel to channel layer simply rearranges 2x2 pixel grid to 4 separate channels. Compared to pooling, this arrangement has the added advantage that no information is lost before processing. Similarly, on the decoder side, we use a channel to pixel layer that bilinearly scales the first channel and then adds in rest of the three channels to the corresponding three pixels. With the optimizations enabled, the mean square error increases by 10 to 15% for both hard and soft shadow case. However, the differences are largely unnoticeable in practice. So far, we have only seen optimizations that are generic and apply across a wide variety of scenes and emitter configurations. Now we investigate scene-specific optimizations where we tune the number of network layer based on the penumbra width of the shadows. To find the maximum penumbra size, we first statically analyze the scene. We collect a few additional parameters at each pixel and use the additional information to find the penumbra width using a simple model. Our model assumes a spherical occluder, forming a convex bounding sphere around the geometry. Using the additional data collected, we geometrically estimate the penumbra size. We compute the penumbra size for all pixels in the dataset and find the 95th percentile penumbra width across all training frames. The number of layers required is proportional to the penumbra width as shown in the equation. We, we next empirically evaluate our model by comparing the predicted penumbra width against the receptive field of the network. We see that the network with inadequate receptive field show increased error as shown in red. To conclude, our approach relies on data instead of brittle manual tuning to improve the quality of traditional shadow mapping. We also show our technique reasonably approximate soft shadows and generate anti-aliased images with just single pass rasterized inputs. We presented several optimizations to minimize overhead and improve temporal stability without using TAA. Thank you for watching.